Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of Erasing Shame. My name is Nancy, and I am your season three co-host. And today, I am actually joined by a friend of mine here in San Diego. This is Kim Dang. Kim actually goes also by her stage name, her artist name as Lady Dang. She is a performer. She's a songwriter, dream coach, entrepreneur, and overall creative living enthusiast. Currently, she's working on music, and you can learn more about her at ladydang.world. So that's pretty awesome because I don't know too many Asian American artists, and um, I really wanted to be able to bring her on here because not only is she an amazing artist, but she's just got so much wisdom and life perspective. And so uh, I hope that you get to enjoy our conversation today as much as I get to enjoy my time in company with her every time I get a chance to connect with her as well. So Kim, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Nancy. I'm excited. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Um, do you want to just give your little introduction and maybe just tell the world who you are and a little bit about your journey just to start us off? You gave me, you gave a great introduction, but um, I mean, right now the, the subject that's in front of me right now is music. Um, I'm involved in music of all kinds, but I grew up off of R&B, hip hop and, um, and, and yeah, R&B, hip hop and uh, soul. Mm -hmm. so I grew up break dancing. Um, wow. I didn't know that. Uh, yes, in high school, um, I was a break dancer and one of the only girls at that time, and uh, that's how I just fell in love with urban music. So it's not, um, it's definitely not a question, or it's not, it's not a question why I'm in R&B and hip hop music and trying yeah. to do myself. So yeah, it's fun. At what age did you feel like you discovered that as more of your, not just a passion, but like a part of a core part of who you are? Sure. Um, it wasn't until, well, it colored my life throughout my life because the influence of culture, uh, especially music culture, hip hop culture, when you grow up the way that I've grown up, which is pretty latchkey kid type way. And we're kind of left to do whatever we wanted to do <laughs> pretty okay. much. Um, you discover just the things that you resonate with. And at the time that was the start, but I wouldn't say like consciously it didn't come into my life to perform until my early college years when I met another woman by the name of Melody, non-coincidentally, her name is Melody. And uh, she was a rapper up in LA and she was on 105.9 um, Power 106 or whatever. I don't know if people out there remember that. Yeah. Uh -huh. I don't even know if it's still there. <laughs> she, um, she was in college just like me, and uh, she was a writer. She uh, looked at some of the stuff that I wrote because I would write poetry and things like that. She invited me to write. And next thing you know, we were preparing for like a 5,000-person college show. <laughs> that was my first so. Was this at your college? No, it was at Cal State Fullerton. It, the year was 1996, and um, we were asked to be put in the showcase it's called Friendship Games. It was one of the oh, biggest okay. things going on back then, and um, I don't know. School would just seem to be so fun at those times because it seemed like different groups like Filipino Americans, Asian Americans would rally together and put on these epic, epic um, events. And so we were part of a group called Asian Persuasion, which we were dancers, choreographed dancers, and you know, singers and song, you know, singers and songwriters and MCs. So yeah. I'm a little nervous right now. I can't talk. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird talking about yourself. <laughs> So you were part of a lot of those performances in college and then now kind of coming into more of your own through that, you're continuing to just put out music and write and stuff. Is that kind of the journey there? Well, that, um, that culminated to Melody and I, we were actually performing just as a group itself, not in Asian persuasion, but just her and I, because we knew we had something special 
And we got with a producer. We started to write songs and record them. We started to go to clubs and other college uh, events in order to perform. We actually performed alongside uh, people knew them as at band clan at that time, but it's like Apple D app and will I am when they weren't famous yet prior to uh, Fergie mm. and they were growing up. So these were our, this is our culture. This is who we were around constantly. And so um, we got picked up by a label because they were looking for a group like ours to put on a soundtrack for a movie and we got signed. So it's something that's been in my life. That's so awesome. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. What would you say in terms of, you know, growing up, were the times that you felt like music was really able to help you and how did it help you get through life? Wow. Okay. So I'll give you a great story. My older sister and this is not, you know, we have a great relationship to this day, but you know, we're, uh, we're Irish twins, 18 months apart, you know, as they say, and um, I never understood why she was so mean to me <laughs> when we got to our older, like kind of older years, like high school years, junior high years. Uh, but considering the way we, we grew up, you know, everybody takes it different. And so, um, I couldn't wait to get to high school because I would be able to catch up and be there with my older brother and my older sister. Mm -hmm. But my sister, I don't know. She just like rejected me and she rejected me in front of her friends this one day. And I just had it. And I said, you know what? Fine. I'm going to find my own friends then, you know, (laughs) literally that pivoted me to music. I mean, like, to break dancing, to dancing, to hanging out with the Samoans and hanging out with the black culture and, and hanging, you know, like, I mean, there's some gangsters in there, but it, it, you know, nobody was thinking about that. Everyone just liked certain things and uh, groupings of people would mix in that way. So um, I, I was just with people who loved hip hop, loved to dance or, like to get together in order to listen to it (laughs) at the very least, you know, so. Yeah. And then I know I'm Vietnamese Chinese and you're, are you full Vietnamese? I am full Vietnamese. Vietnamese. Is this kind of a weird thing for your family to have, uh, you know, someone in their family who's into hip hop, break dancing, anything like that? Because in our culture, I feel like it's not always embraced. (laughs) Was that always the same for you growing up? Well, I mean, to this day, uh, I can't say that it's something that that my family really gets. Yeah. The younger, the younger generation does, of course, the ones, because I was first born in the, in the U.S. of mm-hmm. my family. So I'm very different than uh, my family who's been born in, in Vietnam. And so being mm-hmm. first generation, as you know, uh, can be quite difficult. Yeah. Um, because you're shouldering both, but no one understands you. You don't like, you don't fit in anywhere. So <laughs> mm-hmm. I kind of, um, just accepted that. I really just accepted that at a really young age to tell you the truth, because when you, when that's all you've known, um, that's what you do, you know, that's what, how you live. So, um, it's, yeah, it's not until you get older that you go, okay, there's more of a support system that others have. And you're, you don't necessarily covet that. You know, it's not healthy to covet that, but it is something, you know, to, to get to know yourself a little bit more on maybe what your needs are and things like that. So. Mm-hmm. Do you want to walk us through that process of what that looked like for you? Sure. Um, you know, that's the thing about being creative. Being creative has no racial boundaries. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. It, people do what people do. Like in the industry, in any industry, in any corporation, in any business, uh, when people set up systems and have nasty attitudes, have bigotry, have racism involved, have sexism involved, ageism involved, that's when it gets weird. Mm-hmm. But creating something supersedes 
all of that. And it, I believe that's why creators love staying in that creative process is because that is what's on the table, not what your, you know, what your skin is or what your, what your gender is or whatnot. And before you get paid for it, before it becomes something that you monetize or something like that, it's a really pure expression of who it is that you are, what your heart cry is. Mm -hmm. So for me, um, staying in that lane has always saved me. And, and what I mean by that is the mind always wants to go into those negative places um, because, you know, we're supposed to be adulting or whatever, you know, <laughs> but I don't, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with adulting in that way. I believe the best adults are kid kids at heart and uh, they stay there. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How are you able to relate that passion of yours though to your family who, you know, did come from Vietnam and maybe have more traditional values mm -hmm. um, and being able to, I guess, let them know that this is who you, who you are and what you're about. Well, that's the thing. Like the way that I grew up, I, I don't, my parents, I, I haven't had them for a really long time. Mm -hmm. um, my mother died when I was six and my father was really abusive. We're, we're good now, but mm -hmm. he was, he was and is out of my life for most of my life. Like mm -hmm. we're just barely bridging a uh, conversation for the last couple of years as as far as our relationship is concerned, and yeah. it's, it's great, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's a weird thing when your dad has been out of your life for most of your life, and so you're kind of just getting to know them just as a person. Even you don't even really know them. So, um, I, I ask for a lot of grace on that, and I just defer to love. Um, but uh, you know, that's the thing with me. I, I believe I walk in a lot of freedom because I didn't have anybody to to shut me down. Um, that's, a, that's what a lot of people don't realize too. Like uh, there's a mindset that says, oh, I didn't have, I didn't have growing up. I didn't have this, I didn't have that. But what did it make room for? You know, those are the things that I'm more inclined to think about. Um, who knows if I would have been creative if I had the standard type A family, you know, like I don't know. I might have been an accountant or something. <laughs> yeah. Accounting is bad, but uh, yeah. you know, my life would have been might have been totally different. So, yeah. <laughs> um, I know we've talked about this earlier, but shame is a big topic now. So it looks like for your experience with your family, it wasn't something you had to struggle as much in terms of choosing a more creative career or outlet. And it definitely served um, in, ter in terms of really being able to nurture your growth and your um, experience of being able to find yourself and your identity through it. But, you know, for you, what does shame mean to you or what does that look like in terms of um, being able to explore that in terms of your music and, and finding freedom through that space? Sure. So, um, as many know, I mean, I've been, I've been through a lot of trauma in my life. So trauma does, uh, invoke shame into your being. And so just because, uh, my, my life pivoted more to the creative, um, I believe it was because of the trauma that I endured, I endured it as well as a young person. So, um, it wasn't that shame never, never tried to attach itself to me. Of course, it, it, it does to everyone. There's no like, you know, no one's immune to that being a fact, right? Um, but I can't say that that was, that wasn't something that could define me because the heart cry was a lot louder than the shame. Does that make sense? My curiosity is about being creative, what that would look like. It's really curiosity and wanting to know was what, was what helped me detach from shame. It, as far as my family is concerned, I mean, I don't, I, you know, I, I don't think that they were intentional on, on, uh, it's, you know, it's tradition, it's, it's, uh, religious views or, or, um, their own situations projected onto you or their fear-based, uh, things. But 
I don't sense necessarily that it was intentional. It's just all that they knew. Mm -hmm. But shame in of itself, when it moves in through people, it, it just likes to attach itself. So if someone's not moving in shame, you know, it, it still wants to attach itself to you, whether it's through a family member trying to, you know, slap you down on doing what it is that you're doing or just somebody who thinks they can do that out there. Because, you know, I'm putting myself out there for music. It's, I know the risks that I'm taking. It's like I'm, I'm in the front lines now in order to take the bullets, you know. <laughs> like criticism. Yeah. And that's what criticism is. It's criticism at its, at its root is shame, I believe. Mm -hmm. There's something being projected onto you that is not necessarily yours, you know. So, um, but we all, we have all done it too because we, we, shame has affected our being. So, we're, we're, you know, we're always trying to see where we hit against those places. Okay, we, we got freedom from that expression of shame, right? Mm -hmm. And then as we move along in our process, we hit and we start rubbing another wall of like, oh, shoot, I thought that was gone, you know, but we're just kind of elevating on another level on it. We're getting better, mm -hmm. but um, we're just elevating on another level. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's what I found. So there's always going to be room for growth. And I think for people like us who are constantly trying to push the boundaries of, you know, just growth and leadership and getting out there and making an impact on the world, then of course it's going to be there. <laughs> because no one's perfect. And, um, but you know what that indicates to me, that indicates, um, we're just getting better, you know, uh, the ego gets checked. It's a good thing. It's a good thing to be humiliated, you know, humiliated <laughs> when your britches are getting too big. But then also, you also know the rise too. When when you are humble and you are grinding and keep your head down and you're about mm -hmm. the work and you're about the honest work too. Um, ne next thing you know, you're rising and it's really not on your own timing. So it's yeah. just it's all people <laughs> so I guess putting it into perspective um shame has its purpose to keep you humble and staying in your lane and so that you can mature properly at the at the pace that is right for you as well as being able to uh process everything according to its time sure I I, I wouldn't credit shame for that I would say that um it's just like, a, it's something we all deal with, mm -hmm. but I, I can't say that I credit shame for being, um, uh, like, uh, what's the word? I can't say it's in charge mm -hmm. in any way. It's, it's more like an afterthought because yeah. the, the human spirit is just, is the, is, is what determines the victory you know what I mean it, it's like you deal with it but the human spirit helps you deal with it in a, in a productive way yes. um, yeah that not every fight is yours you know like oh okay that means nothing and yeah. and if it does mean something then you have the chance to deal with it uh, directly that's what I like about it. It's like when it, when it's off, but it's from some, somebody that you love or know, or is close to you, then that's an opportunity to deal with it. And that's like the greatest uh, environment for change is right there. When people show up and deal with it. It's when How, people, Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. How have you been able to deal with those moments when shame pops up in, in, for you so uh, honor is like really important to me you know uh there's things that i do that no one will ever know and those are my greatest moments you know it's what you do in private that makes you who you are and so um i'm the first to to apologize if i inadvertently did something because no one's perfect you know i want to create that space in order to have the conversation and the hard conversations. Um, 
but sometimes, you know, uh, because the call, shame is so pervasive like that, that it, it does something to the brain and in the heart that uh, doesn't allow people to, to defer to honor in order to just show up to and deal with it. Now, the most powerful situation is when two people show up or a team shows up mm -hmm. and it gets really real, you know, uh, and I've been privileged to be um, elite. You know, I, I'm, I've been privileged to live individually like that, but also be a part in a, in a, in a grouping of people who, who value that as well. So um, it's really cool. I would say, if, if you can do it, I know a lot of people are afraid of confrontation, but it's not really confrontation. It's really, it's love, really. Because if you care about making things better, then you wouldn't allow something to get in the way of that. Mm -hmm. Pride, sh you know, shame, shame, all of that kind of attaches itself together. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, they're very uh, attached to deep-rooted emotions, and it just seems like it covers the full spectrum. Um, but somehow, a lot of it, it, a lot of the times, it disables us. So, for someone who is going through shame and doesn't really know how to get out of it, is there any words of advice that you would give to them? You know, um, I belong. I belong to a faith family, and the leaders of my faith family they talk about. The best thing I've heard about shame, besides Brene Brown, I mean, she's just off the top, but um, there's so many people that are just geniuses out there regarding this particular subject and being vulnerable. But my, the, the leaders of, of uh, my faith family, they, they said shame likes to attach itself to every single one of your memory in order to darken it. Mm -hmm. And so what we're thinking, what we're doing as adults, reflecting back on something that maybe we didn't know about that was going on at the time, and then we get the truth of what was going on at, at the time growing up. What we'll do is cast like a judgment. Oh, I didn't know that was going on. So it takes away all of your great memories. And so when uh, this was coming up, I had asked, uh, my pastor about so I don't want to say that because it's I don't think it's true that ignorance is bliss I, I don't want to I don't think that that statement is true and and uh, the answer was so great it's innocence is bliss mm. the innocence is bliss and we can what I would say to everyone out there is is protect your innocence that's the best way for shame not to attach itself and darken every single memory that you have in your entire life. And just stay in that lane, stay in that lane because it's, it's definitely freedom uh, from so many things like making yourself a project, making others a project. I, I, I hear people speak about themselves and, um, it's like they're trying to get to the bottom of themselves, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, um, it's a little bit scary because there is no bottom. <laughs> so, you know, you, you can dig all you want, but you're not going to get to the bottom, you know? So yeah. the question is always, well, what do you want to do now? Yeah. You know? What do you want to do now about it? And, uh, where do you want to go? Those are really the only two things that matter. So, <laughs> so protecting your innocence that seems like um like a vague concept for a lot of people so can you define that a little bit more or give good questions to think about in helping to protect your in innocence sure okay so your greatest memories of when you were small that does that don't have anything to do with anybody else it's not attached to any memory of it, your dad your mom it's just how you were whether you're in uh, the, the room playing piano on your own and you were just making up melodies or whatnot. Um, see, for me, I'm always going to defer to music or performance art because that's what I was doing. Um, 
the scenes of like me being in the bathroom on the counter doing an Irish spring soap commercial, cutting up the, the soap over and over again and doing it in the, <laughs> doing that, you know, repeating that commercial over and over again uh, in the mirror. And my grandpa so mad at me because all the, the soaps cut up, you know, like before that's funny, you know? Um, but those secret times, those secret times that you know about mm -hmm. and um, that if, you know, you, if you, if you have a hard time recalling, just sit there and open yourself up to recall and those memories will come back to you. And at, at, at its very essence, um, that's who you really are. That's who you really are. You want to remember that person. Lots of um, teachings, lots of views. They say, go back to the child in you, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I believe, it, I believe that that child has never, has always been there. It's never going back. You know, it's always like that child is very present and there if you wish to speak to that person inside yourself. <laughs> so. so I guess once you identify that childhood memory, um, what would you say it looks like to protect mm -hmm. the innocence around that? So at that point, it's like, okay, a lot of people have that story, right? It's like, I didn't, I didn't have this. If I had more of this, everyone has that story. If I just had more of this love from my mom or dad or like if we weren't poor or like whatever but um to how you would protect it is just remember what it felt like and how and the freedom of just being a kid you didn't have the worries that you do today where you had to pay bills that yeah you were totally dependent on somebody else but you were still who you were when you were born <laughs> and you're still very much that person. So this, the unpacking of the conditioning that's been put on you, not in a psychological way though, you know, just more of like a spirit way, like in a, you know, a spirit way where it's just like, well, well, I don't even know where that came from anyway, because the child in me, I don't even remember that person acting like that. They didn't act like that when when um when i was three or when i was four i love the ages between three and six mm -hmm. i believe that's why i love the ages between three and six is because the personality comes out they're grown they're who they are and then they just start getting bigger but they're very much still babies you know i believe that's the reason why that age group is my favorite age group <laughs> yeah so meaning you uh, have no fear you feel like the world is still fully open to you and a lot of the wounding that we carry as an adult like it hasn't happened yet right and you have better verbiage than I do um I, I definitely you definitely have better verbiage <laughs> <laughs> how have you been able to um use writing though to be able to better express yourself or have an outlet to be able to articulate your thoughts and release a lot of these right conditioning that we've had over our adult life <laughs> sure um oh writing has been with me since i can remember uh i remember writing my very first story in class about my father and um my father was my hero and he was in aerospace he is he was he's retired now but he's an aerospace engineer and we, you know those big pieces of paper with big margins and they have a huge space on top you write your story and then you can draw a picture i don't know if you guys remember that in yeah yeah uh, <laughs> so um it's super fun i do remember getting his square jaw and putting him in a suit and just writing about him mm. and uh, i don't remember the story but I had a huge imagination when I was younger as well. Mm. So besides, I noticed that it started getting more like, my, my writing started getting more like depressive. <laughs> 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 like when I was in my college years, you know, like my journaling and stuff when I was in my late teens 
and early early 20s that's when things it's just like so emotional (laughs) (laughs) I don't know if you remember that but it seems so emotional and if you if you grew up 42 so if you grew up during that time R&B and hip-hop were all about that it was all about like I'm in love and you broke (laughs) up me and I don't know what to do I'm gonna die you know (laughs) And we were just spinning it like a soup, you know? <laughs> yeah, this is how I'm feeling, so all I want to do is listen to it. <laughs> and it stirs in you all the emotions that you've been wanting to feel, but you needed an outlet to be able to contain it. <laughs> well, you know what? That's what I thought. That's what I thought at the time, but it was just stirring me in the soup. It wasn't until I got older that I realized, no. <laughs> <laughs> No, there has to be hope attached to it or else mm-hmm. or else it's just you're stirring in your soup and it's just not helping you mm-hmm. <laughs> at all. It's just emboldening everything that's going on in you, which you still don't have an answer for. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it, it wants to it wants to kind of express itself in that maybe unhealthy ways because there's no there's no outlet for it. Yeah. But when there's hope attached to it, there's there's like there's an outlet for it, but it's healthy. You know, it's like, oh, okay. I didn't think about it in that way. Yeah. There, here's, here's the story. And then I didn't, here's the hope part. And I didn't think about that. You know, I didn't think about the hope part. So let me just hold my horses right now on all these crazy emotions. That I'm feeling. Yeah. Let me sit down for a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> I know because for me, I study psychology and I'm going through a lot of that right now of just self-awareness as I'm going through some courses about shame and arrested development and maturity and all that stuff. And um, obviously through my own healing journey, and it's it's easy to get stuck in that, right? Because you can continue to study and study and people go through PhD programs and clinical psychologists. And then the leadership development aspect where you need, we talk about in terms of the world of coaching, it's so important to be able to have a vision pull you through that or have a healthy outlet to be able to then express either the pent up anger or confusion or something that you can actually create with. And that's the beauty when you be able, when you're able to get to that place. And I think it's just so awesome to be able to start seeing the stuff that's coming from you in terms of the singles and you had a music video release and it's just so unique. Like, I don't even know if I could have ever thought that up for myself, you know, because I just don't have the creative brain like you do. Um, how did that even all come to play? Is it just like continuing to write or like, how did this imagination really stir in you? I definitely have a history. It's really, it's how I, it's trauma and, and having uh, not being neglected. I mean, uh, I needed to occupy my time with, with something of substance, you know, and it, uh, literally I sense this is just how also not to like, you don't have to be born this way, even though my design is this way. Um, because we all can learn more creativity in our lives and it, it'll, it'll activate areas in our brain that we hadn't activated before. Our brain is an incredible thing that it, the neuron, the, you know, the neurons are always firing off in there and they're always, the brain is always growing if you do new things. So that's what I didn't lose. And that's what I, I guess this is can pivot back to the innocence, um, protecting your innocence because it's the curiosity. Mm -hmm. My, my world as a kid and to this day is still the same when it comes to what could be, what are the possibilities when I was younger, I didn't have resources, right. In order to, manifest the imaginations but as I got older gotten into dance having that expression um writing having that expression I always had art you know I always had art I was always making things so there there's always a manifestation of it and you can look back in your history and see that it's been building since then so I have a very strategic mind I mean you know, I inherited that from my mom and dad. I mean, my dad's a genius and so is my mom. So <laughs> um, I can see things. I'm very strategic. So I can just see things, how they would fit. 
And because I can see the bigger picture being a, a visionary, at that point just comes the action of it. It's like, oh, who's good at this? I'm good at this. I'm good at, at speaking the vision and then getting teams rallied up in order to see the vision come through. Uh, because I'm big on culture of honor and um, being excited about what you do and not shrink. You know, you wanna be fully who you are, regardless of if you're imperfect or not, it doesn't matter. You wanna be fully who you are um, for those chances to express itself. Because you, in doing so, you're inviting all of these things in. You're inviting, uh, you're inviting the vision you're inviting the people who can support the vision, not just yourself. And then the next thing you know, like all these people are around you helping you build this thing and then it becomes real. So. Yeah. <laughs> that, yeah, that's the exciting part about imagination and about a vision and about just trying something new. It's that you're welcoming my language and my verbiage about it because I've been doing it for so long is I get to see who is going to help me do this. I get to see what's going to happen, you know, like who's involved, what's going to happen, all the surprises on set, all the surprises from the little kids that I'm asking to dance, you know, like me being like a dance choreographer to these other kids, you know, it's just like you just become all of these things that you didn't even know you would do. Yeah. You didn't say yes to the vision. Right. So there, I don't want to, I don't, I, there's so many things out there that want to point you to the, if you follow one through five, you're going to get this, you know, there's so much of that going on right now. People are monotonizing that to the death right now. Let me monotonize my process so that you can have it too, you know? <laughs> It's like, but everybody's process is so different. Yeah. So those are great tools, right? But there's something waiting to be expressed in each person that has not yet been seen. So mm -hmm. that's what's exciting about the possibilities. Yeah. yeah. So I guess the, the takeaway from a lot of it is, you know, being able to create more creative outlets in your life so that you can find a greater level of freedom. And especially if you have children, because a lot of that happens when, you are still a child and your brain is still developing to really create safe outlets and creative expression uh, for your children to be able to find themselves in as well so that they can be able to, as an adult, um, be, fear, uh, be free of shame on a deeper level that a lot of other people traditionally do fall into because they haven't explored as much creativity. Sure. Um, fear, you know, shame, fear, it all attaches itself to each other. It runs in like a little gang, you know? <laughs> yeah. You know, like this bully gang that tells you in your mind, like, oh, you can't do that. That's a stupid idea. But generally speaking, when you hear that, you should actually do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because there's something about just finding out. You're, the satisfaction of just finding out whether you uh, fall flat on your face doing it or have any success doing it. That's not your call, you know, but there's an adventure waiting, you know, that adventurous spirit. There's something that said that I, that's really resonated with me for a while. And uh, it just recently, and um, it says, if your glorious days are in your past, if you're, if, if, if your most glorious days are in your past and not in your future, you're already dying. Mm -hmm. And so there's these, there's these things that shame, the thing that shame does is keeps you boxed in mm -hmm. from even thinking that you could. Yeah. It's a bully, you know, it's like, Oh, you better get back in the box. But just like all bullies, it's all huff and no puff, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you just walk past the bully and then you get to experience this world. Yeah. That you never 
would have experienced if you had listened to that bully, mm -hmm. right? So you can't care. You can't, you can't care about the bully. You want to care about the thing that is, is, is calling you. From On the other side, like yeah. fear is false evidence appearing real. There you go. So anytime that we have a fear, the best way to be able to get to the other side of success is to face it instead yeah. of continuing to hide behind the shame and right. living small. Right. Um, and it's not an easy thing, but I think from what you're sharing and in, even in my experience, that's where you find freedom. So yeah. find that courage inside of you to to be strong enough to continue to take those Goliaths down one by one. <laughs> you know, it's so amazing that, um, gosh, the power of a vision and curiosity and just childlike wonder about mm. it and going after it is more powerful than all of those things combined. It's more powerful than, but you wouldn't know that unless you allowed it. Yeah, and, you know, the, it's the permission that people are looking for, but they're, but they don't realize that they're the ones that are the ones that are going to give them the permission. It's themselves, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, yeah, well, that's a beautiful, yeah. uh, ending I note. <laughs> okay. I just want people to take a chance on themselves over and over again, you know, take a chance on yourself over and over again. Yeah. I was going to say that was just um, some beautiful thoughts to really leave our audience with, but I think we are at our time. Do you have any other things to add in before we wrap up here, Kim? No, just that, you know, I wish everyone um, childlike wonder and to give themselves a chance to live a life that they'd like to create, That's something they've always imagined, whether it pans out that way or not. Uh, at least you know, and that's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Cool. <laughs> um, if people want to find more about you and the work that you're doing, hopefully we can connect some of your music videos because you guys have to check that out. It's pretty cool. And on she's website, creative, yes. and she's got all her, you know, stuff in action: the makeup, the hair, the set. <laughs> um, yeah. If they want to get connected with you, uh, where do they go for that? Sure. So www.ladydang.world is my music page. Uh, Facebook is Lady Dang Music, and my Instagram is Lady Dang World. So either mm -hmm. one of those. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so that wraps up today's episode of Erasing Shame. Really, I think the message today is just really being able to embrace your creativity and just me being able to hear your story and seeing how it serves you so well to be able to have that outlet and being able to fully live into the full expression of who you are and feeling confident in that, as well as knowing that you are being able to create something that's beautiful for the beautiful for the world. Um, it's just something that's undeniable and, you know, it's just something that continues to drive you and pull you forward. So if you haven't explored that for yourself, then maybe it's something to consider as well as for, you know, the next generation, being able to leave space for them to really find themselves in a deeper way through the arts. So for now, that is pretty much it for today's episode of Erasing Shame. So we are signing off. This is Nancy and Kim Ding. We're Erasing Shame one story at a time. Thank you. Thank you. Ugh, I couldn't. <laughs>